start a recording. Uh, so the stream is up. We cannot be heard over the uh, o over the stream because there is no uh, audio sources. Yeah, it's not loading here yet either. Hmm. Okay. Right.
Okay, well, hello. Thanks for joining us. My name is Graham. My name is Stephen. Uh, you'll be able to see who said that uh, very shortly. Uh, we are just getting ready here, and I just wanted to do the little uh, teaser thing uh, to let you okay, know well, that we hello, are here. We are here to retain your Objective C, and we will be going live now. Hello, Stephen. Hello. And hello, Welsh Panther, and hello, Eugene19. Uh, nice to see a couple of people in chat for our first episode. Right, I see Shish Kebab is here as well. Nice, hi Shish Kebab. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Objective C Retain. Uh, I see uh, Adrian, uh, a calls match. I can't. I, I can just about pronounce Adrian's surname when it's written out in full. I can't pronounce that abbreviation. I'm going to call him I Am Leg. Um, that's, a, that's a joke that comes from our other stream, Dos Amigans, uh, which will be on tomorrow where we uh, code Amiga software. Anyway, uh, this is not that. This is uh, Objective-C Retain. Um, yeah, uh, we wanted to uh, make sure that the Objective-C community had a home where we could you know, talk about uh, the coding that we do, uh, our love of Objective-C, and about uh, the availability of um, free software uh, platforms and uh, and how you use them. Because I think a lot of people uh, who are familiar with Objective-C will be coming from the Mac and Coco and uh, you may be looking for uh, somewhere to keep their code. Uh, you know, should Apple sort of double down on Swift and start to make it harder to uh, do Objective-C or you know, maybe have uh software that no longer fits the app store model or whatever um there there is there still is a place for your modern objective c code to live and that is in the world of free software yeah there are a lot of and the, the, there's a great uh, library of free software that already exists um that was built primarily for apple platforms that we get to start with uh, so um a lot of the things that i want to see come out of the work on this stream uh, not necessarily from the stream, but from the things that we talk about, are going to be getting some of those um, free software applications working cross-platform using um, uh, using these things. And so um, there, there are a few that I am sort of the def have become the de facto maintainer of, including uh, um, Coco Fibs, which is an online backgammon. Uh, game player uh, that works on Macs, uh, and I'm I'm intending to port that to um, uh, GNU Step, and also uh, an R RSI timer called Anti RSI, um, and things like that. And I, I think that that's a it, it'll be nice to have a new home for these applications, and also uh, to be able to expand their potential user base by making them available to all platforms and not just uh, the fruit flavored ones. Yeah, I agree. So um, I have been working on um, uh, someone else's uh, word processor called uh, Bean, which is um, a, a, an app that's existed for a very long time. And the the author has a freeware but um, proprietary closed source project called um, uh, called Bean version three, uh, which they still support. Uh, but they released Bean version two as a, a GPL3 product a long time ago. Um, and so I have been uh, sort of uh, tidying up that, adding new features like cloud, uh, cloud document sync and so on. Um, and it would be good uh, yeah, to, to sort of work on this like little suite of applications and bring, it, you know, uh, we were discussing this before the stream went live. Uh, I've been told my volume is low. I am going to... Uh, so Matthew, Matthew thinks that. Uh, oh yeah, that is correct. Yep. Uh, sorry, I thought I thought that Matthew and Adrian were saying two different things, but it turns okay, out they're saying exactly the same. How's that? Uh, is that any better? Look in the bottom of OBS, Graham, and you'll see the. Yeah, I the, see the, the, the level. I, I see the thing going very, very red. It is very angry. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. Because <laughs> there's a there's a peak level. 
which it'll it'll leave that mark. Oh, uh, Matthew says that's better. That's good. Okay, how about um, now? Anyway, uh, let's let's yeah, carry on. If that's better, I will stop uh, saying thing. Stop fiddling with the knobs. Uh, anyway, so what I was going to say <laughs> was that um, okay, great, much better. That's good. Uh, yeah, um, so it'd be nice to sort of bring like the what I think app, the Apple platform has is a sort of consistency of design of approach, mm-hmm. conformance to the human interface guidelines, and you kind of see that to some extent in like the GNOME community in the uh, KDE uh, community, but I think that there's a particular mm-hmm. sort of design aesthetic. Um, that came from Next and then through Apple, uh, and also from Apple's own uh, sort of you know, branch of history, if you like, uh, that is yeah. really nice. And that bringing those sorts of applications to a free software desktop, but also you know, just like making sure that those of us who like you know have an emotional attachment to Objective C, I'm not beyond admitting that it's my favorite programming language, and that I have you know a, a, an emotional enjoyment of it. Like let, let's just have somewhere that we can hang out and uh, you know and talk about Objective C and write some code. Yeah, this is. Uh, I I also for different reasons probably have have an emotional attachment to Objective C, but I definitely have an, a, a strong attachment to the consistency uh, of uh, design that we find on Apple platforms and Apple platforms since the beginning. I mean, the Apple has always had the human interface guidelines. Uh, Gnome, as you said, has a, has a similar thing. KDE less so. Um, oh, and, and actually Gnome and KDE are really great examples of this because they have two completely different philosophies. Gnome's philosophy is take the, the core, boil your app down to its core functionality and expose that to the user in a nice way. And KDE's, uh, uh, opinion seems to be give the user maximum configurability and let them twiddle all the knobs. And those are valid things uh, in Apple land and also um, uh, in, 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 in next land by, by, by extension, we got, uh, you know, user interface research was done. And these are the things that we found were best. And this is what we want to, uh, uh, to, to, to perpetuate. And that is um, one of the other reasons why I'm excited about this stream and what we're doing here is that I think that those consist- bits of consistency in, uh, are going away. That we're finding that uh, um, that we're finding that that uh, you know when, when the iPhone first came out, for instance. The apps, a button looked like a button looked like a button, a text field looked like a text field and behaved like a text field. Scroll bars were always the same. You could just, you, and look and feel is is much more um, uh, carnal almost when you when you're interacting directly with the 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 the, the slab of glass in your pocket, and uh, it's really important the, those user interface things. Now we, we're getting a lot of cross platform apps and a lot of you know every every application team has a designer that wants to reinvent the universe and so on. Uh, so we have less of that now, but I still think that that is the core of of software. Is that software should be usable, and consistency is really important to that. Uh, Shish Kebab says, uh, "Now do Windows." Uh, <laughs> well, we're talking about we're talking about consistency. Windows has no place in this conversation. So yeah, I mean, what I admire about the um, yeah the Microsoft approach is their commitment to backwards compatibility. Like, I've Absolutely. Got- uh, you know, I, I, I've got DOS applications, I've got Windows 95, certainly, and possibly three applications on my Windows 10 computer, and I can run them. But where they have um, updated their approaches to UIs, they've often like um, just allowed the existing things to uh, run as they were and not, um, you know, not sort of brought them into the modern world. Um, I think, you know, the I I personally enjoyed the little foray into what they called Metro style, um, and they, uh, you know, it was a an interesting take on how to build a single UI that a wasn't centered around like the apps and the you know, icons and trademarks of the vendors, but was centered around the data that people had, um, and b scaled from like a tiny little. 
uh, phone to a big like you know uh, projector screen uh, display. Mm-hmm. But again, it was completely inconsistent with everything that came before, and so there was just a like kick you out into the desktop mode when you wanted to use um, the other thing. Absolutely. Um, there's a there's a really great blog that I don't have a link to handy, but I think it's Raymond Chen uh, who blogs about this. Uh, he he's a long time Microsofty, and he tells great stories about the the lengths that Microsoft goes to. Uh, to preserve backwards compatibility, um, at one point he did a blog that I really that that, that stuck with me because it, it I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, where in I think it was Windows XP they had a, a chunk of code to decide if the user if the current running process was Sim City because Sim mm. City had a use after free bug that would cause Windows XP to crash. And so Windows XP, the, the, the version of Windows the bug was in, I'm saying XP. Windows XP had a workaround for this bug that it would load the, the Windows 3.1 memory manager into a process so that SimCity could do the thing using the old memory management system because Microsoft decided if people's old programs crash, they won't like our new operating system. That's a different kind of consistency. Mm, no, um, absolutely. Maybe not consistency, but it's a different it's a different approach, and and I think a respectable one. Um, but it's not the one that I care about. I care about consistency of user interface. I think that is paramount. Yeah, sure. So um, there's a question in chat that I want to address. Uh, Eugene nineteen mm-hmm. asks, uh, "Could you please mention what capabilities does the GNU version of Objective C have? Does it have class properties, OC unit, XC test? Uh, did it get direct methods?" So. What we are going to use, um, and we're we're going to uh, probably start with, um, so this being our first stream, and I know that there are people in the audience who don't have any experience of programming with Cocoa or Objective-C at all, we're going to do a a sort of whistle-top tour of the history of the language, and so that question is definitely relevant. Um, And then we're going to uh, switch to a a live coding screen and we're going to do some sort of introductory level um like you know tutorial content uh that won't be true of like next week's uh stream we're going to look at it maybe uh one of these apps we want to port from the mac or maybe um adding some features to uh, GNU Step, or you know, maybe something else that comes up in the chat if people have ideas of what they'd like to see. Um, but yeah, so th- this one episode is going to be a sort of self-contained uh, introductory uh, thing. All of the episodes will get, after the stream has gone up, they will get um, stored and uploaded to Peertube, uh, and the Peertube link is on the... Um, uh, wherever Twitch puts its links relative to where I am on the screen, uh, there is a right. link to the Peertube channel there. Um, right. But yes, uh, like we we should definitely answer that question. We are going in our live programming environment. We are using uh, the Clang Objective C compiler. Uh, we are using um, the GNU Step Objective C runtime, which has all of the features that you know from Objective-C 2. I don't think it has direct methods which were introduced by Apple um, th- this year, th- this obje- this like WWDC 2020, wasn't it? Um, it's new sort of uh, e- effectively inline methods that don't get, um, don't go through obviously message send. Uh, okay, I had never heard of direct right. methods, so that would be why. And uh, and OC Unit actually started life as a GNU Step uh, compatible project, um, mm-hmm. so there there is no XC test per se, but there is a, there is OC Unit, so you can definitely write your unit tests in that. Uh, GNU Step also has its own um, like test framework. I often use um, Catch, which is a, a third party library by a guy called. Uh, Phil Nash, who now works, I think, at JetBrains. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's a sort of slightly more declarative style of syntax. But, yes, there are there are options for these, and, uh, you know, both Stephen and I are quite keen on test-driven development. I wrote the um, test-driven iOS development book, in fact, uh, and 
Stephen wrote um, our spec. So you know, between those things, uh, we've got a bit of uh, prize on that. So we will definitely be covering uh, TDD uh, at, at some point during the course of these streams. That uh, URL you typed in does not go to oh, anything, no. so we might have to update that later. Oh, no. Um, it is not the same as the C++ native header-only thing, is it? That's the one you want, yeah. Okay. Uh, that is, here's the GitHub for that, called Catch2. I've never yep. used that. I have so catch lib, used that CatchLib does, does, does go to Catch2, doesn't it? It does not. Uh, when I click it, I get can't open. Ah, uh, okay, so maybe I need to not put the... Um, ah, the yes, HTTPS. it does. Yep, you need to explicitly specify HTTP. There we go. Yeah. Okay, well, All never right. mind. Um, Either way. Is that the one that SR Baker linked in the chat? Uh, so, yeah, um, that is written in C++, but uh, it does, uh, you can just, like, you know, write your um, tests of Objective-C in .mm files, and because it's header-based, you never actually need to use any C++ syntax or any C++ language knowledge in order to write tests of Objective-C code. So, you know, I, and it's highly portable, so that's one I've used before. Mm-hmm. Um, so talking about the uh, compilers, there are two other projects to mention. One is obviously GCC. Uh, GCC's Objective-C support is not uh, as up-to-date as Clang's just because that's where Apple invested all of its uh, time uh, from, uh, you know, fr from about the time of Objective-C 2 uh, onwards. Um, and the GNU Objective-C runtime which is not the GNU step Objective-C runtime. Uh, so this is, we, we probably ought to explain what one of these is in a bit, but I will... Yes. Um, uh, do you want to do that while I'm looking up the link to the... Uh, so uh, my understanding of the GNU Objective-C runtime uh, is, and I only know this because of the story about Next Step uh, and how, how they tried to... De uh, deliver objective c uh their objective c stuff so um back when steve jobs uh left apple uh not because he died um the first time he started right the first time he left apple um he started a company and they built objective c and Objective-C was built as a set of object file, uh, a, as a, an extension to GCC. But because of the GPL, you have to uh, produce the source code for the thing. And so in the first incantation of this, um, Next decided that the install CD would uh, link the Objective-C object files with the GCC compiler and... Uh, therefore, they felt that they didn't have to uh, distribute the source code um, because the linking was being done by the end user and not uh, being distributed, link, uh, pre-linked. And so the GNU Objective-C runtime, as I understand it, uh, was provided by Next Step and was the original Objective-C runtime. Is that more or less correct, Graham? Um, no. Uh, so... Oh. <laughs> So the, like okay. it, it was in part um, the so the uh, Objective C originally started at a different company called um, Stepstone. Actually, originally called right. Productivity Products International, and I, I think we'll sort of leave that history aside and come back to it um, shortly. Uh, but yeah, you you are right that um, next uh, licensed Objective C from. Um, PPI or Stepstone, whichever name it had at the time, and they wanted to use uh, you know, use it in their platform, and they wanted to uh, incorporate it into GCC, and so they wrote um, their runtime library, which is called the Next Runtime Library. So what we never answered was what is a runtime library and why do I want one? Um, right. Objective C is a uh, a, a very dynamic language. So a lot of stuff is done by running some code to say, right, what happens next? So when you when you have the square brackets with, uh, or you know, the 
square brackets, the square brackets with your um, message in it. That's a message in the literal sense. Like you are telling this object, here's the thing I want you to do. Now you work out how to do it. And um, amongst other things, the Objective-C runtime is a library that contains the function that answers the question, how do I know what an object should do when it receives this message? Um, so Next had their implementation of this. And what you said about them uh, trying to work around uh, the requirement of the GPL by linking it after uh, they had uh, installed it is absolutely right. And um, Next thought that this was uh, compatible with the requirements of the GPL. Um, Richard Stallman thought it was compatible with the requirements of the GPL as well. Uh, but Eben Moglen did. Eben Moglen, who was the um, Free Software Foundation attorney, uh, said that this is what, you know, that a court would probably consider this to be basically a vexatious workaround, that it is uh, complying with the letter, if not the spirit, of the, mm. um, of the license. And that a court would take that into account. They would say that this is clearly an attempt to work around this in spirit. Um, and therefore, and in his understanding of American uh, copyright law as it existed at the time, would be considered a violation. And so the Free Software Foundation changed their, um, their view from next to doing it right to next to not doing it right. And that made... Uh, next open source or publish the source to the, their version of GCC, including their Objective-C runtime library. But uh, RMS decided that probably they would take the toys and run away at some point. So uh, the GCC project started its own Objective-C runtime library and Objective-C compiler support uh -huh. as a separate implementation because there already was a free software one, they could fork it and then they could uh, maintain it so that it could never go away again. Um, and so the Objective-C one is essentially an insurance policy that was uh, created by the Free Software Foundation. And it it works slightly differently from the next Objective-C runtime and doesn't work at all like the, uh, you know, the sort of Apple Objective-C 2 runtime or anything more modern than that. There is another one that's currently like doing the rounds um, by a guy called Nat Muller, um, who runs a company called Muller uh, Kyber Kinetic, uh, and it's called the Muller Obti uh, runtime, and it's got its own fork of Clang and its own uh, runtime library, and he's you know got his own uh, libraries. Um, I have to admit I haven't used that, so I don't have much uh, to say on the topic other than there is still novel uh, Objective-C development. So you've got the, the next one, which is the one that um, obviously was used by Next, but also was used by Apple on the 32-bit platforms. Then you've got the Apple runtime, which is the, like essentially the thing that like, currently underpins Objective-C and Swift at Apple. Uh, the GNU runtime, which is the old one that was created as an insurance policy by the Free Software Foundation. And then the GNU Step runtime, which is the one I've linked to in the chat, which is a modern runtime that uh, was created by, uh, I think, David Chisnell um, of the GNU Step product, project. Yeah, it looks like it's a, an amalgamation of uh, the GCC, the stuff that was added by Etoile, um the and also uh, some stuff added by Microsoft as well. So, uh, so David Chisnell is an employee of Microsoft Research, so he might have done some of it. Uh, okay, as a work project. Right. Um, yeah. The yeah the the Etoile runtime. Uh, so we're 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 kind of doing the history in non chronological order, which I'm fine with, <laughs> and everyone who's got video editing software will also be fine with. Uh, <laughs> The, so Etoile was a, a, a collection of software and user experience on top of GNU Step. It was a, an attempt to sort of build, you know, the like the, what Mac OS X is to Cocoa, 
uh, but on, on GNU Step um, with applications, libraries, and um, well, actually that's it, applications and libraries. They, the Etoile runtime, which was definitely David Chisnell uh, leading, was uh, essentially a research runtime, and it was very different from uh, all of the other runtimes. It could do things like record the sender and recipient of a message in the message um, so that uh, you, know, you, you could do things like decide w how to respond to a message based on who sent it or if it was a proxy you could find if your implementation was proxying you could find out who the original recipient of the message was when you were responding to it in your um, you know, in your proxy recipient uh, and it had um, slots similar to like the self or JavaScript language, so it was a very different uh, beast. And you know they kind of did that, and it was interesting. And they uh, learned how to do that, and then just uh, wrote an actually Objective C compatible Objective C runtime, uh, which is the GNU Step runtime. Um, a Cosma, that's the closest I'm going to get to that uh, particular handle. A Cosma asks, what happened to the Cocotron runtime? So uh, another project that I haven't mentioned is the Cocotron. I can't remember the name of the uh, guy who was behind that project. I met him at a WWDC in about 2008. Um, but he, that was a, so Cocotron was an MIT licensed implementation of uh, Objective-C Foundation and AppKit for Windows and Linux uh, and a cross compiler for Mac. So you basically like added this compiler to Xcode, added a Linux target and a Windows target to your Xcode project, and then built your application on you know, on Xcode uh, for Windows and Linux. Um, I think it was, you know, it was a very uh, interesting project. It was fairly capable. Uh, you know, its implementation of Foundation and AppKit was reasonably complete and very high quality, but I don't think it's kind of built the um, the ecosystem of support and of interest that is needed to, uh, to to sort of keep these things going, to build the momentum. Yeah, there was another one, uh, Cocotron and GNU Step, there was a, another one that was specifically aimed at getting your Android application, at, at um, Android only. Was that... I don't remember what that was called. That was the UI kit one. So was that app portable? Yes, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Mm. Um, I've got a feeling that that was very heavily based on GNU Step, uh, and um, right. Yeah, we, we, it was basically GNU Step plus some uh, like other bits that because they were different libraries didn't need the it didn't need to be open source. Um, what? Yeah, the, I mean, one of the beautiful things about Coco is just how how portable and and it's just really nice to work with um and the the portability and the the ability to re-implement it is really nice um it's uh so a thing that we didn't cover which i think for at least one person who i know is in chat uh is sort of the history of coco itself mm. um uh, we've we've talked about some of the re-implementations and the original implementations, um, but in particular, um, sort of where does Coco come from rather than Objective C, I guess. Um, and uh, again, one of the the recurring themes of this of, of this stream, which is not necessarily different from our other stream, is that Graham has all of the knowledge, uh, <laughs> and I have a, a high level understanding of uh, of the things uh and so uh so i will uh, i will give the 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 high level summary and graham can jump in and point at all the places where i was wrong <laughs> but basically coco um is an object-oriented framework for software development uh that was created at next step uh which is the the company that um steve jobs started uh when uh when he was fired from apple and um and it was it was ab all about at the time objects and networking were very uh were, were were sort of 
very popular and, and, and new and, and, and sort of the buzzwords, kind of like JavaScript and Docker today, um, except they were useful. Uh, and so we had, um, uh, so Next Step built an operating system and an a- and app kit, uh, a-, a kit for building applications, which uh, Coco is basically just the, the modern name for app kit. Um, uh, app kit was just an object oriented way of building applications. It was very popular uh, among people, uh, um, uh, among a lot of people, very popular in desktop publishing um, and in education. I learned about it uh, way, way, way before I could ever afford anything with a Next logo on it or even an Apple logo on it because John Carmack, uh, the creator of Doom and Quake and Wolf 3D and id Software, um, famously did his uh, development on Next Step hardware and then would later port uh, what he developed to other platforms because he just liked developing on Next Step. Uh, so if you... If you go looking around, one of one of the applications that I would love to see uh, ported and working on GNU Step, which I think is actually probably not a, a difficult port in the grand scheme of things, is QuakeEd, and it's possibly that it's already done, which is the map and level editor for Quake. Um, John Carmack built that in like I think uh, I think in in like a weekend in Cocoa, and he uh, when I learned about this, he he had written uh, I learned about it and was intrigued because he said. I can't think of another uh, another platform that I could have built this on in a weekend, uh, and and so that was why I was very interested in it. So um, so next step uh, begat uh, AppKit, which became Coco, and uh, I think Coco, uh, when Apple was looking to get off of their uh, was looking for their next platform. Uh, they were they were trying to get away from the old way of building software, sort of the MPW way of building software, and they they developed a new thing called Carbon, which I think was uh, came out in Mac OS eight, and this was before sort of the uh, Steve Jobs used Apple's money to buy his company from himself, um, and there was sort of the for for a little while Carbon was sort of the the halfway point of getting getting your classic software working on OS ten, and AppKit. Uh, from next step was named Coco. This is where you will see the prefixes. Uh, Objective C lacks namespaces, and the prefixes on all of the um, on all of the uh, the classes are NS, which stands for next step, and that's sort of the history of this uh, um, of this. And now I think it's time for Graham to come in and point out all the <laughs> places where I was completely fucking wrong. No, I I, I don't think you were uh, wrong in the slightest. I think like yeah, there's there's definitely a lot right. of Coloring in between the lines that can be done, but you know, I think what you said was uh, largely uh, largely correct. Um, so uh, the, let's let's talk about the NS thing first because that is contentious. Um, the OpenStep, which is version sorry, o- OpenStep is two things. Oh, I didn't talk about OpenStep at all. Yeah. Um, right. So OpenStep <laughs> is two things. One is it's version four of Next Step, the operating system. And the other mm-hmm. is it's a an API specification that's the thing that Coco is essentially the successor to, which it was. Sorry, um, I can't do that right now. Yeah, uh, Siri thought did I was you talking say, to him. Did you say CI? I think I must have said CI. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, uh, OpenStep is the API specification that Coco is is like directly inherited from and is basically a sort of tidy up and rewrite with some new ideas of the next step um app kit APIs. Uh that that was a collaboration between Next and Sun. Um by which I mean Sun gave Next a, a wheelbarrow full of money and said could we have a modern version of this that we can run on Solaris. Um and uh, and also like can we you know review the api docs and like you know, make some changes and so on so there is a suggestion that ns stands for next step but as um a cosmo pointed out in chat the uh next were already using the prefix nx throughout the earlier versions of next step huh. to refer to next um things not 
uh, uniformly. Often they would use the name of the uh, framework. So like indexing kit would have IX as its prefix, for example. Database kit would have DB as the prefix. Um, but they did use NX in some places. So maybe NX stood for next step. Uh, maybe it stood for next and sun. Um, they, no one has ever sort of definitively answered this. And like I've even had an Apple engineer uh, try to troll me by saying that it stands for namespace because there weren't any. Um, <laughs> definitely not. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> let's go go back to um, yeah, what I was saying uh, before about this company, uh, Stepstone, because they were the people who actually wrote the Objective-C programming language. Uh, when um, the August 1981 issue of Byte magazine came out, uh, it was the you know the famous small talk issue that had um, articles by like Dan Engels and Adele Goldberg and you know a bunch of the people who had been working on small talk at Xerox and it had the hot air balloon escaping from the ivory tower on the cover. This was really the thing that got um, object oriented programming out of some small research group in Xerox and into. Uh, the sort of public consciousness for the or into the software professionals' consciousness for the first time. Now, Tom Love, who was one of the founders of Stepstone, tells it like this: that um, Brad Cox read that and brought it into uh, in, into a meeting with Tom Love and said, "I think I could do this in C. I think I could add this kind of object-oriented programming to C." Um, and yeah, they thought that was like an interesting diversion, and so they uh, he attempted that. And definitely by 1983, uh, he had a thing called the Object Oriented Precompiler, which was a very slightly different syntax from what we know now, um, but basically a thing that took uh, small talk style message syntax uh, and C expressions, and then. Um, transformed them into compilable C. And then they decided that, yeah, that this was a useful uh, product because it would improve um, like software engineers' capabilities. Uh, so formed this company, Productivity Products International, and by about 86 were already like you know, selling Objective-C. And Brad Cox wrote this book, Object-Oriented Programming and Evolutionary Approach. Now, this is not the Kernigan and Ritchie of Objective-C. This is a book about the philosophy of object-oriented programming where there are a few code examples and those code examples are in Objective-C. Yeah, this is about Brad Cox's view that software at the time was a, uh, a sort of cottage um, industry with everyone reinvented everything from scratch, a very inefficient and very... Um, like uh, sort of uh, art artisanal, and it didn't need to be. In order to improve the productivity of the software industry, it needed to undergo an industrial revolution, um, and that we needed to be using standardized parts and uh, like interchangeable components. So just like put reading data sheets, finding the components we wanted, pulling those off, and assembling them into software products. And so he had this idea of this software IC or integrated circuit. You know, if a C instruction is like a resistor or a transistor or a um, capacitor or something, then an object made out of Objective-C that bundles all of these resistors and capacitors together into a package that you can use is a software IC. And it has a limited interface. You know, it has a few pins on the edge that you can push signals in and read signals out of. And all of the complexity of how that works is contained in this IC in the middle. And that was the basis of their company was the Objective C programming language, and the, um, the what they called IC packs, which were collections of objects. And the idea was that there would be an ecosystem with other people having their sort of packs of um, of objects that you could buy, and that, like there wouldn't be application vendors. There would be um, there, there there would be component vendors, kit vendors. And applications would be written by the people who needed to use them, and just by pulling 
these Objective C objects together and like building their own applications. Um, clearly, that's not the world we have now, though it is an interesting world to think about. Uh, Next. It would be if you searched Sorry. for the components on uh, Stack Overflow and then pasted them into your application. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I, the, what actually enabled reuse more than um, a, any technology or any paradigm was actually just like free software licenses and the ability to, you know, if you want PNG support, then you just like compile the PNG into your application. That's a that's yep. an aside. Um, so, like, Next basically wanted to build the Smalltalk workstation, you know, the Xerox Alto with Smalltalk, um, but with, as you know, in some reasonable amount of time, so they used a load of off-the-shelf components to emulate it. So, you know, instead of the writing the Alto's custom operating system, they used Mach, uh, which is like a derivative of BSD Unix. Um, don't at me. They, uh, instead of using... Uh, small talk they used objective c um instead of like uh, writing their own bitlet they licensed adobe's display pro script so kind of took these bits together and made an object oriented workstation out of it um lots of people well sorry a very small number of people absolutely loved it and a very large number of people never saw one and didn't care um but you know some of those people were influential you already mentioned john carmack um a Cosma in the chat mentioned um, CERN, who had next Tim Berners Lee used one to write the first web server and the first web browser. Um, I think that computer is in the Smithsonian right now, that with still the sticker on it that says, "Do not turn this off. This computer is a server." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, next were very uh, influential in terms of. Um, you know, approaches to like software engineering and object oriented programming, like uh, you know, pretty much everyone who has a um, a graphical uh, UI builder has got one because interface builder was a thing. Although they weren't the people who invented that, but they definitely sort of popularized it. A Cosmos says that computer is in the entrance of CERN in Geneva. Aha! Uh -huh. I've only seen pictures of it. I haven't hmm. been to Geneva. I suspect that Acosma mm. has been to Geneva. Yes. <laughs> I believe Acosma is currently a student at ETH Zurich, uh, or at ETH anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, so like Next did a thing that people liked, but not enough people liked it. And around like the mid nineties, the uh, like so sort of ninety four, they were licensing. Um, their software out to other platforms. Uh, it, uh, it, it it ran on Windows. Uh, it ran on Next Step. Obviously, I've already mentioned Solaris. There were talks uh, to get it to run on IBM's AIX, but apparently AIX's threading model uh, wasn't sufficient to run uh, the, um, the multi-threaded uh, OpenStep architecture, so it, that just fell apart. There were um, discussions to run it on alpha, like you know, it almost became uh, before like CDE and the um, open desktop. It almost became the de facto standard for Unix desktops and available on Windows as well. Uh, but mm -hmm. what actually happened was, as we know, um, Apple were uh, suffering from what we would now call technical debt in the you know their operating system um, had sort of hit an evolutionary dead end and uh, replatforming was going to be uh, incredibly hard. They had internal projects called like Copeland and um, this idea of uh, projects blue, pink and red to um, <laughs> describe things that they could do as a an immediate upgrade, things that would take a longer time and things that required a complete rewrite of the operating system. And I think red was that internal rewrite, um, the Copeland project. They partnered um, with IBM on a startup called Taligent to build an, uh, an object-oriented operating system in C++. Um, that uh, I don't think ever hit the market. Um, also, uh, very specifically, emotionally interesting to me, uh, they talked to Jean-Louis Gasset yeah. about buying BOS, 
um, which uh, I was very interested in at the time, and I I, I would have loved to have seen that mm. um, uh, as well, or or instead of perhaps uh, because BOS is really cool. Yeah, and so you know, like we can hypothesize on why, but again, that's not the timeline that we're in. We're in the timeline mm-hmm. where they uh, went with um, next uh, with what Steve Jobs called Plan A instead of Plan B, um, because they didn't buy BOS. <laughs> and um, the rest, as they say, is history. It, it's a lot more muddy than that. Uh, Apple were actually very, very heavily invested in Java at the time and added Java support to Coco, added Java support to Web Objects, which was next Objective-C framework for building web apps. Um, yeah, the, the world almost became a very different place, and that's where the name of the stream comes from, is that at the time that Apple were trying to replatform everybody onto Java, the next people who really loved Objective-C were turning up to events like WWDC with Ob-C Retain written on their T-shirts. Um, they did retain Objective-C, and it became you know the basis for uh, Coco. Coco was basically a trademark that Apple had knocking around, and so that's why they renamed OpenStep to, to Coco, just because they had uh, a spare trademark that they could use and um, you know, and, and put their name to a thing. Uh, there's no deep meaning uh, behind it at all. I love that Apple just has spare trademarks floating around. So it was, they had acquired a company um, who uh, made some like educational software, which uh, they had renamed the software, uh, which had been called GoGo. So they, that that's why. They don't bother now, they just keep the same name. That's why like Siri is still called Siri, because they bought a company called SRI. No, I was waiting for I was waiting for your Siri dude. Yeah, the one time I actually used the word, uh, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> Graham and I, well, Graham figured it out after the fact uh, that C, saying CI uh, will, uh, which uh, you know is a thing that we talk about from time to time, uh, will aggravate his um, <laughs> uh, his talking computer. Yes, it is funny that the extension of interface builders files is nib. Yeah, for next interface mm-hmm. builder. Yeah, that's uh yeah. There's uh the, the the I think the history of this stuff is really interesting. Um and, and you know, uh not necessarily the what could have been, but definitely the you know what what was happening at the time. And uh, how computing looked at the time, and 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 things like that as well, because there are um, some things that are, you know, not that different. Uh, Windows is still the dominant platform, uh, if you it, depending on how you count, um, and it was at this time as well. Um, but there's room for other things, and I I, I think that that is really important as well. Hmm. So speaking of other things, you know, a topic that's come up a bit in that history is. Portability. Um, Next mm-hmm. ran the Next Step operating system on four different hardware platforms. So initially, just their own, which was a Motorola 68000 based uh, workstation. Um, mm-hmm. Then later on, uh, Intel 386, on um, Sun's Spark, and on uh, Hewlett Packard's PA Risk platform. Uh, and then mm-hmm. they also ran the software OpenStep Enterprise for Windows. And OpenStep for Solaris on um, on Sun systems as well, but someone whose name unfortunately escapes me, who was uh, working at the Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, in well, presumably somewhere near Stanford in California, uh, had a, uh, a a graphing package that they were working on, and still are the lead maintainer of, uh, called HippoDraw which was on Next, and they needed to port it to some other Unix platform. Uh, and so what they did was just re-implement the AppKit library uh, for uh, you know, for sort of portable Unix platforms, and that was called LibNext. But that is sort of the genesis of there being an open-source re-implementation of the um, Cocoa APIs, was this LibNext, 
which then after um, the open step specification was published became GNU step which is like now you know I know we've already talked about there being multiple free software implementations of, of Coco or of libraries on top of Objective-C but uh, like GNU step is the one that we're going to be focusing on in this stream and it came from that sort of history of wanting to get um, software that was written for Next and run it somewhere else so I think you know that kind of um, that coincides with our motivation to get you know some good software that's been written on the Mac and make it available on uh, freer platforms. The only platform that I ever had the opportunity to run uh, Next Step on that I owned was actually a, a, a PA Risk pizza box form factor thing uh, that I, I I found some Open Step uh, installation disks for. Mm. Uh, I don't think I ever experienced it on 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 anything else that I owned. Um, it's it's amusing that Next Step itself ran on four different hardware platforms because we're now sort of seeing that again with um, you know Mac OS X uh, ran on uh, PowerPC and then Intel and is now going through another transition. And so this seems like. Um, it could just be that you know the most the the most profitable company in the world can can you know can you know the the company the world that has the most money in the world can basically do anything because they can always throw money at a problem. But I think it I I want as a technologist to believe that it has something to do with the underlying technology uh, that these things are 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 possible, not only possible at all, but uh, relatively easy. We've seen. Uh, clearly relatively easy because we've seen other things that haven't happened in the same period of time that people have wanted to happen. And uh, so, so we're seeing another hardware platform uh, transition happen. I mean, it's definitely and, true. Uh, that to the is, M1. Sorry. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. So like the, yeah, the five platforms, depending on how you count that Mac OS 10 has run. Right. right. Power PC, Power PC 64, uh, 386, x86, 64, and now um, um, Apple Silicon, whatever they're mm -hmm. calling it. Um, and for the next round, on next definitely weren't the richest company in the world. Uh, right. you know, they, I mean, they had deep pockets because like Steve Jobs had made billions off Pixar, and so was able to. Yeah, you know, I mean, they'd been given some like fuck you money from. Oh, sorry, there's the mature audiences tag. He, he'd been he'd been given a, a golden parachute from Apple, uh, and had you know, made money on the IPO. And he had um, also made money off of Pixar because, like George Lucas, had had to sell that cheap in his divorce, and um, <laughs> right. yeah, and that was before Toy Story came out. So, like, uh, and one of their investors was um, Al Gore, the invent inventor of the algorithm, uh, and so like they had right and the internet, yeah, yeah, exactly. So they had some very deep pockets uh, behind them, were able to uh, carry on going. But I am told that in Next's life, they only ever turned a profit in one quarter. And I'm also told that one of the um, field consultancy teams didn't submit their expense reports in time that quarter. And if they had done, then Next would have lost money that quarter as well. So, uh, you know, it was <laughs> never a profitable business. It was never a particularly big right. selling business. I think there's you know, maybe 50,000 Next workstations ever made and ever mm -hmm. sold. About 10,000 They're very of them. hard to find. Yeah, about ten thousand of them went into the NSA. Uh, you know, f few universities, uh, you know, few like large banks and things. Um, definitely, like it was rare for someone to buy one for personal use. They cost tens of thousands, and then the, um, the the developer license cost tens of thousands more, unless you were in academia. So uh, yeah, it was a very rare system to see. Uh, but you know the. Uh, the underlying operating system, uh, which was sort of hybrid, uh, Mach, BST, Unix, was highly portable, and uh, that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that probably did stand them in good stead for being able to uh, work on these partnerships with all these other uh, vendors. I think it has a lot of. Sorry, uh, a Cosmo is right. I meant yeah. Ross Perot, not Al Gore. Oh, <laughs> I, I think it. I think it. It. It speaks to, from my own personal experience, it speaks to. Um, the 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 messaging, the uh the the messaging paradigm in object oriented programming, uh for portability because 
um, there's a lot less um, appeasing of the compiler and a lot more make sure that this object can respond to these messages. Um, and it, uh, you know, and there there are you know different uh, different failure modes for those kinds of things. But I I think that um, it, it it certainly fits my brain uh, for for those things. Um, when you want to, somebody uh, joked uh, once when I was uh, I was talking to some Objective C language runtime people, and they said, "Oh well, Objective C is a very easy language to implement because you only have to as soon as you have a, a obj-c message send, then you're done." And uh, they're joking, obviously, mm. but I think that there's uh, what when you when you have uh, you know every com every good complex system is built on on simple ideas and simple systems. And I think that that, uh, that, that, that carries on into, uh, app kit and Coco and, and the portability of it. I mean, uh, the portability of it, even if we just talk about processor architectures, if you include all of next step, all of open step, all of Mac OS as one thing, because I, I, I certainly do. Um, when the, when the iPhone came out and the iPhone SDK came out, I think with, iPhone OS 4, I think, was the first time we were allowed to write. Uh, the first time when we didn't have to use the really great solution. Is that what it was called? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, sweet the sweet solution. solution. Yeah. The sweet solution. Uh, when we were allowed to do things without using the sweet solution. Uh, it was... It, it For me, I looked at UI Kit and said, oh, this is Next Step. I already know this. And obviously there are a few differences. Uh, and actually, and, and, you know, as time has moved on, there are many, many more differences, but, um, but it was, it was a simple set of ideas. I already knew how object oriented programming worked. I already knew how messaging worked. Um, and adding to that level of knowledge was really nice. So it was portable, not only for computers, but portable for humans as well, I think. Yeah. I, and I think that again, you have to, um, you know, look at uh, next and the consistency of the design. You know the the fact that they use um, similar naming conventions across all of their libraries. Uh, mm -hmm. That they use like uh, you know consistent um, conventions like uh, it saying get for um, a pass by uh, reference parameter or um, you know uh, result by doing thing as like the the way that they build the selector names um and mm -hmm. that yeah, that means that even if you don't know your way around a library you can just read the uh the sort of header and find out what everything does and and guess and probably get it correct yeah this is this is uh i i realize that you know we don't always have documentation anymore in modern programming but this was a thing that i really appreciated when i was working on um, iOS apps full time. Uh, recently, when I was working at the bank here in Sweden, uh, I I would always go to the documentation. That was where I went to learn about new things and is this thing available and so on. Uh, and that that made me weird in the office because people would ask me a question. Hey, Stephen, do you know how to do this? And I would go to their computer and I would hit uh, you know Command Option Shift Zero, I think, to pull up the quick find in the documentation. Mm -hmm. I would type in the thing in the documentation, and we would find all the documentation. And people complain about the quality of Apple's documentation, but it was always there. Um, there, necess there wasn't necessarily tutorial stuff, um, but but the documentation was there. And if you just, if once you had just a little bit of experience, you got used to the conventions, the naming conventions, and where to find things. And that is that consistency was really important. Hmm. Um, a Cosma in the chat uh, asks about nil messaging uh, being uh, part of the first iteration of Objective C. Uh, I want you to talk about that, but I think that there's a there's a related idea that I wanted to mention, which is um, the uh, when the iPhone first came out, uh, Android had, had you know was around a, around the same time, and when an Android app would crash, I would get a pop up on my Android phone that said null pointer exception, and I would have the ability to click OK, and I didn't know. Nobody knew what that meant, except for, I mean, programmers know, but a user didn't know what that meant. They just knew they had to press the OK. When an iOS app crashes, it would do nothing and dump you back to the home screen. And this comes back to uh, an idea that was in a paper by Ward Cunningham, I think in 1989, where he 
talked about a small talk system where when the small talk system would run out of memory, there was an accounting system and the accounting system would run out of memory periodically. And so the accountant would type in a thing and it would run out of memory. And uh, so they would just make the window disappear when it ran out of memory because they knew that if we just make the window disappear, the user will just try to do the thing a second time. <laughs> there was no need for an error message. There was no need for anything. Just it didn't take... And so do it again. Mm. And that was a thing when Apple, uh, when the iPhone came out and your iPhone app crashes and it just dumps you back to the home screen, but it's got content reloading. Uh, you just, what, what happens when you get dumped to the home screen and you're in the messages app? Well, you start the message, you just tap the messages app and go, and v nearly all of the time, unless you were hitting a really bad bug, you would just be right back where you left off. And you might even think that you did the wrong thing. But it was just a it, it, it that was just a, a nice consistent thing that I I really loved about the usability, uh, and uh, I was reminded of that. But then the nil messaging bit, uh, I think that was sort of a core feature. But I could be wrong about that, Graham. It, it's definitely a core feature for um, the Objective C language that we all know. But I do believe it was added by Next. Um, I do okay. not think it was in the um, the Stepstone version of Objective C. Uh, interestingly, what um, you know, what everybody thinks Nil does in uh, in like next to Apple Objective C and Gnu Step is what it does by default. There is actually a um, a runtime feature that I think is now private uh, on the Apple platforms, and um, but it used to be uh, exposed, or at least you could you know, uh, write a little function. Um, declaration for it and use it called obviously set nil receiver <laughs> what that mm. would do because uh, obviously like sending messages to nil so for for people who aren't used to you know i, I know that there are people in chat uh, uh, and watching the stream who uh aren't familiar with the objective c programming language um it is allowed it is permissible to send a message to the the nil object which is a, an alias for null pointer and you don't get a null pointer exception. You don't get a crash. You don't get um, like you know uh, nostril demons, as um, the like C Compilang C fact would say. Uh, what you get is nothing. The res the result of sending a message to nil is nothing. And if it returns a value, it returns nil, but like cast to the appropriate type. So zero for integers and floats. Um, you know the null pointer for strings and structs and like uh, and um nil for objects actually the struct case is weird when you were saying like all you've got to do is obviously message send struct cases are weird it's not something we need right. to get into <laughs> they just generally are um but yeah so it's got this convention that um that the result of nil is nothing happens um which means that you can build like you know very fluent APIs by saying right, this thing does this thing and then the, uh, the result of that gets sent this message and then the result of that gets sent this message you build up like a paragraph of text put some square brackets in the middle and you've got an application but and then if something uh, along that pipeline um, returns nil like you know let's say a, a, an error happened or there was no outcome to a, a task then the rest of the pipeline just like silently uh, does nothing, and you know, but opinion is divided on whether that's good or bad. Like, you know, basically, based on whether you are used to it or not. Um, yeah, and you certainly design. You learn to design your software with that in mind, and so people who are mm. people who become used to it see it as a feature, and people who are not see it as a, a as a as an anti feature. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it all comes down to uh, it all comes down to how you design your software, and you design your software differently based on what's available. Hmm. But there's actually um, a runtime function called obviously set nil receiver that uh, breaks a lot of like the fast path code in the Objective C runtime, which is why Apple started hiding it. But lets you do something else. So you know if if what you want to do is to um, like log every time that nil is sent, or to um, break into the debugger whenever nil is messaged, or like you know any of the other things that you might like think you can do in a small talk uh, environment, you could at one point on Apple's platform and probably still can on like uh, on other runtimes um, 
just change the behaviour of the nil receiver. This is a thing that uh, uh, comes up in other dynamic languages. Um, in in Ruby, uh, we don't have the um, uh, the nil messaging uh, bit in Ruby necessarily, uh, but uh, it will throw an exception. Uh, it does not understand um, um, exception. Uh, Maybe I'm getting the naming wrong, actually, across languages. Um, but in Ruby, we didn't have method that. Missing. But in Ruby on Rails... Ruby. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, well, it calls method missing, but the default implementation of method missing uh, will will raise okay. an exception. Uh, so in, in Ruby on Rails, we have a different thing called whiny nils. Because <laughs> when you're building a web application, what you actually want is a stack trace to where did the nil come from and what were you trying to do with the fucking thing. And so... Uh, in Ruby on Rails, they say, "Well, we're gonna, we're actually gonna uh, uh, change, you know, all, the nils are actually gonna be very whiny nils, and you can do something else at runtime in production application." Uh, in Smalltalk, you you uh, uh, it calls MNU message not understood, and the default behavior of that in development mode is to throw up a debugger. And so in Smalltalk, in development, you when you when you send a message that an object doesn't understand, you get a debugger, and very often that means you haven't implemented that yet, and so you implement it in the debugger and hit proceed, and that's a very nice way to, to develop. Obviously, it's a different it's a different way than if you're doing other things. And uh, when you're running your web application in Seaside, a Smalltalk web application framework, certainly you want something else to happen when you hit a nil. You maybe want uh, uh, you know, uh, a notification to be sent to the ops people or something. Yeah, instead. the number of times that like a web application has stopped because it's been sat in the debugger in some like server room somewhere. I know that that has <laughs> happened with Seaside applications. I've definitely I've had that with my own Seaside applications where uh, you know I got a call from from the customer and and they said hey I, uh, you know it's just spinning it won't finish loading and sure enough I VNC into the server and I've got a debugger popped up and I just twiddle twiddle and hit proceed and while they're on the phone and they go oh it's working now thank you <laughs> sorry to bother you and but they at not knowing that i had actually just logged into the debugger and fixed something mm -hmm. um and so you it's really nice in these dynamic environments and this is something that'll probably keep coming up in this stream is how much we both enjoy dynamic environments because you can change the behavior that you get based on the needs of your application um in a running application on a on a you know on your your uh, your your naked robotic core uh, you know, glass glass device in your pocket, you don't want to see exceptions uh, popping up. But when that thing is plugged into your computer and you're developing for it, you probably want to see some of those mm. exceptions from time to time uh, and be able to deal with them in a debugger preferably. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, uh, things that are, that are available to us when we're programming in dynamic environments. And I hope that we will get to explore a bunch of those uh, in the course of this stream because... I think that is the the power of Objective C and dynamic environments, um, is it, are are the interesting things that you can do. Well, shall we explore a programming mm -hmm. environment now? I think we probably should do that. Uh, I need like a two minute break, uh, so I'm going to run and do that. If we uh, if you want to switch scenes and uh, start talking through, I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so I am going to switch to. Heads and computer. You get to look at um, Stephen's chair for a bit. Uh, a Cosmo brings up the idea of swizzling. Swizzling is when you, um, in uh, Objective C, you can replace an implementation of a method with another implementation at runtime. Um, so, you know, if if like you're writing a, an app kit app and you know there's a bug in one of Apple's methods, you can swap your own. Uh, implementation uh, for that method in. Um, it can be uh, dangerous. Um, it, you, there used to be a thing called uh, posing where you could say any instance of this class should actually be an instance of this class instead. And so you know, I want all buttons in my application to actually be my version of button, not next version of button or whatever. Um, but, but again, very uh, powerful. I, you know, what other frameworks give you the ability to uh, work around a framework work 
tweak bug by writing your own implementation of the small parts of the framework that you actually need and substituting that uh, everywhere in your process that you encounter it. So um, a bit of inside baseball while Stephen's away. Um, and uh, so answering the question, this is a free BSD uh, based system. It is called Live Step. Uh, so that uh, FreeBSD is the operating system. There is then a uh, sort of live environment of it called Fury BSD, which is optimized for like just kind of creating like you know bootable USBs that you stick on a um, you know on, on some uh, laptop or desktop computer. And then this is Live Step, which is Fury BSD with Window Maker and with all of the um, GNU Step um, software installed. Uh, it, it's a fairly a uh, recent project, I think it might have been about October last year that the um, developer uh, uh, like put up the first image, and it's that image that we're using. Um, there's some sort of discussions on the uh, the GitHub project. It's still very much a, a live project, um, and I think there are sort of like uh, some daily builds. But I don't think there's been another release since. Um, but it is uh, FreeBSD with Window Maker and with all the GNU Step applications. But from my perspective, it's on this monitor here. So when we get into coding, I'm going to be looking over there, which looks a bit weird. Or I could pull the camera over uh, if it, you know, if it really gets too much. Um, but that's why I'm looking away. I'm not being rude. I'm actually <laughs> focusing on the the coding. But you know, for, from the perspective of what we're going to do uh, through this stream. It doesn't matter that it's um, FreeBSD or Live Step. It you know any Unix where you want to use uh, the GNU Step environment, whether it's the Linux, whether it's a BSD, uh, whether it's like um, you know Solaris Open Indiana, whatever, uh, will behave like this. And all of these tools are also available on uh, Windows and on Mac OS X. So yeah, you know, wherever you want to do your GNU Step, you can do it in the way that we're doing our GNU Step. Yeah, it might look a little bit different if you look if you load GNU step say on 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 Debian, you'll get a more next step feel uh, because the themes won't be installed. But I think mm. that that's another thing that speaks to the uh, the niceness of working with a dynamic environment where you can inject things. The theming in GNU step, uh, in this case where it puts the the menu bar across the top, um, that's just a thing that overrode the drawing methods on NS menu item, I think, um, uh, to give you a, a slightly different look. And so it was really nice. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a very nice desktop. Um, this is a really nice distribution to work with and, but it may not look exactly the same if you're using it elsewhere. Uh, so. Okay. So uh, yeah. And, uh, says that there's a link to a video I made of this, uh, on the readme. Uh, and that link is broken. I will find the correct link. Ah, can't open a page peertube.co.uk. I hope that that peertube instance hasn't gone down because uh, that would uh, mess up my plans to upload all the videos to peertube. Well, we're getting another PeerTube instance anyways. It turns out that running your own PeerTube instance is a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> uh, but Shish Kebab in chat is handling that for us. Uh, nice, For Thank both you. streams. And uh, it, it's just, it, it's winding up being a lot more work. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of dependencies in PeerTube land. So many, in fact, that I okay. asked on Twitter... Uh, is there a peer tube alternative that doesn't have so many dependencies, including Node.js? Nice. Uh, and uh, I got zero answers. So it looks like peer tube is what we're going with, but um, uh, we just have to we we just have to suck it up. Or so Shish Kebab has to suck it up. This video is also that that particular video is also on YouTube. So uh, for the moment, I'll stick a link to the YouTube copy mm -hmm. in the chat. Suboptimal, but better than nothing. Um, unfortunately, like the the archive link on the Twitch uh, channel is also to PeerTube. So um, yeah, if if we do get another instance sorted out, I will um, put it there. In the meantime, I will put the videos up on YouTube so they are at least available. 
That's great. Uh, yeah, the, the, the peer tube instance or, or uh, if not peer tube in particular, a video hosting platform is coming. Mm. Um, that is uh, that is what Shishkabob is working on right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also we will do a uh, lobsters instance for this stream as well so that we can share, uh, you know, relevant links and discussion and uh, and things like that. Uh, nice. that's, okay. That is that is currently Shishkabob's job. So. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so what I thought we'd do, just like like I said at the top, um, what I want to do for for this stream, uh, and what we talked about doing was just doing a gentle introduction to these tools, both for the people who are new to um, Objective C, but also for people who are familiar with Objective C but not familiar with some of the um, Canoe Step tools, so that uh, you get a, an idea of like what the what the standard tools are um not every application is built with these things but at least you get to like you know experience them a bit um so what i've done is gone back into the uh my um history library and found the apple book learning coco uh which was um i think uh, it's definitely not credited but i think it was written by uh, Jim Duncan Davidson. Um, James Duncan Davidson, yep. Yeah. Uh, I think his name's on the cover. No, Apple Computer Inc. is the, oh. the, the author on the, the cover. All right. Um, so, uh, th- there, there, there was a... Um, yeah, there, there is a dichotomy with doing this, because on the one hand, if I get out the 10.0 tutorial book and say right we're going to do this everyone will go oh wow Gulu steps really out of date um but if i go okay here is uh blocks and here is um you know uh properties and here is like a load of advanced objective c stuff then people who are new to objective c will go wow this is uh really um you know difficult to uh, to follow so we are going with the old stuff, not because it's all you can do with with canoe step, but because it is something you can do with canoe step. Yeah, and uh, canoe step has uh, a, a lot of brand new APIs. It's missing some of the new stuff. It's missing some of the old stuff. Um, some stuff that it's missing is easy to reimplement. Some stuff that's missing, we you you just won't uh, come across in most usages. So. Uh, whether it's available in GNU stuff or not is not really a an ongoing concern for us uh, because also what we find missing that we really need we will implement it and send it upstream because uh, we we want to contribute to the community yeah uh, even even more I think we both have you have more but I think we both now have patches in GNU step yeah. from uh, Fosdem a couple of years ago hmm. so. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, um, uh, I, I'm always uh, impressed, uh, surprised by what is available and surprised by what is not available, uh, and um, it's uh, it, it's it's definitely it's nice. So, um, do you have your copy of this book here? Uh, I don't. Okay. I have the. Hang on, I have the digital copy i do yeah. not have the physical copy no sure let me, um let me get it so there's a section on single window applications which is probably the the easiest thing to do in like 40 minutes or however much we've got left um yep. there is a hello world project there is a section on essential coco paradigms which is about collection classes guis control cells formatters target action uh, object ownership uh, retain and release. There's a currency converter, um, a section on event handling, a section on table views and data sources, uh, or a travel advisor app. Do any of those um, meet your uh, your enthusiasm buttons? I I generally like um, the idea of of running through an application rather than. Uh, here's how to use controls of this kind or whatever. Okay, um, so that would mean so maybe the application would be. So it? there's a currency converter or a travel advisor. Uh, currency converter is something I use almost every day. Right. Well, let's uh, do one of those then. So uh, in 
my copy of the book for what it's worth. This is um, page 98, although actually um, a lot of that is describing what we're going to do. Uh, so, uh, Eugene 19 says currency conversion means some networking will be used. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. That definitely depends on depends on what we uh, on 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 how deep we want to go. Yeah, as you can see uh, from the UI, there is enter the source currency, there is enter the conversion rate, and then there is find out the amount in the target currency. So uh, we won't be talking to any live uh, conversion things. Sorry, you you were in the middle of a sentence. Right. No, the, uh, the fortunately, uh, most networking software is uh, done using BSD sockets, and we have access to those. Well, fortunately, it's all done using um, NS URL session, and we have access to that as well. That's even better. So uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, uh, obviously, this book is uh, old enough that a most Macs weren't necessarily permanently connected to the internet, and b um, it uses the old. If it yes, it has a mention of URL handling, and it's the old uh, NS URL handler um, paradigm. Um, GlueStep does have NSURL sessions, so it has the modern approach to uh, um, to, uh, to to networking. Okay, well, uh, I am at, I, I'm waiting for O'Reilly's website to load. Ah, uh, sure. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to load. So you carry on. The IDE, which is called Project Center, um, and. I'm going to create a. Oh, uh, could you use. There we go. I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to change the project type to application. And I'm going to probably call it currency converter. I'm going to type we're using the correct keyboard and then call it currency converter. So this is Project Center, which is the IDE. Um, that, uh, sorry, uh, it, it is the IDE that is part of the GNU-STEP project, which is not the same as saying it is the GNU-STEP IDE. Um, it is based on the interface builder from the old version of Mac OS X. So the UI is quite um, old and quite uh, like uninspiring. Um, perhaps, and certainly unfamiliar to anyone who's uh, used to Xcode. In practice, um, a lot of people don't uh, use it. You, know, you could easily use Visual Studio Code or Atom or like, TextMate or Emacs or anything for editing your um, header and uh, implementation files. Uh, however, we're going to do what it tells us in this um, uh, you know, in, in this tutorial rather than uh, what we would like to do. Uh, in future streams, we will do what we would like to do. Uh, Eugene asks, does it create make files? Yes. So we will see uh, somewhere around here. Uh, there there are three uh, files. There's the make file. Ah, none of these files are actually opening in the... Um, an editor, which is, I, I wonder whether. Okay, okay. So the the source files are opening, but the make files are not. That is annoying. All right. Well, let's uh, open text edit and open those open one of those files and see what it looks like. This reminds me what we were trying to do when we uh, messed up the installation last week. Hmm. We were we were installing Emacs. That was it, yeah. <laughs> and this is choosing not to show me uh, file uh, any of the files. This is harder than I thought. Let's let's do it in G Workspace then. All I want to do is to see. This make file and open it in a thing. Are you going to open it in a thing? You're not going to open it in a thing. 
That is really annoying. All right, last resort. Wrong keyboard. I've nearly broken OBS as well. <laughs> okay. There is a make file. Um, what it does is it create... Uh, you set some properties and then you import... You tell it what all of your source files are and then you uh, import Gnu steps application.make. Mm -hmm. Eugene19, I think you're right that... Um, Text edit is probably showing me an open panel for star.txt files, um, which is f frustrating. And G Workspace is probably just doesn't have an association set up for, um, for text files. So it's not letting me open it in text edit either. Um, I might be able to do. Yeah, there's no application set up With for no. make files. Right. Okay. Uh, do you have, can, can you tell text edit? Uh, can we um, drag and drop from... Um... No, it's useless. Right. Yeah, uh, good question. Helpful. No, it doesn't want to accept the drop. Uh, what about onto the window? Hmm... Um, I annoying. think that would just add it as an attachment to this RTF file, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would. Uh, that's no okay, good. okay. Well. Okay. Well so, then. So we're not going to look. Well, we're not going to look at the make file apart from in the terminal. But. Um, that's fine. Project Center. Fortunately, is, we don't have to do a lot yeah. of work with the make file. Uh, Project Center, which is this one, is going to. Uh, look after it for us. And the preamble and postamble are where you get to... Uh, uh, these aren't managed by the tool. So you uh, get to... Um, uh, like, put your own sort of variables and your own rules in there and not have them trashed by Project Center when, it, when you do anything else. Right. Okay, so then... Um, what you know, the things we're going to want to do are build, which is this uh, screw uh, icon, or you can build for um, you can uh, clean, which is this bottle of detergent in front of the screwdriver. Uh, <laughs> All right. This this is how um, we did it in the next days. So that worked. I mi I miss that icon style. The sort of <laughs> 3D, uh, I think that the, the GNU mail icon is fantastic. Um, I, I miss that icon style. So this is the, these are the run and debug icons. So we can run our application uh, and, you know what, uh, nothing happens because we haven't, uh, we haven't built an application yet. Right. Oh, I could have done with that bringing every... I think what, what is going on here is that um, the software we're using for uh, pair programming is interrupting a lot of the mouse events, and so that's why like a lot of the window depth and a lot of the controls are a bit screwy. Um, right. I, I'm inside. very careful to keep my mouse pointer out of that, uh, out of the window, but I'm not sure if, if that's helping. <laughs> um, it's also certainly uh, you know a, a VM inside of a computer running the thing so it's uh, yeah so the inside baseball is I'm running FreeBSD in a virtual machine and that uh, I'm also the computer that's running the virtual machine isn't the computer that's running OBS and so I'm doing HDMI capture to get it into the stream so there, there's a lot of complexity here and Stephen is on a different landmass um, and uh, he's yes. talking over the internet at me as well. Yeah, this uh, this is uh, this is th this is just as complicated as the other stream. <laughs> so, it is. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I guess it says the the first thing we want to do, I guess, is uh, it, it's suggesting that we make the windows and build the user interface here. Yeah, so we want to mm -hmm. open the main nib. Oh, that, that. so in I believe GORM is the uh, uh, is the uh, interface builder. That was not what we wanted. No. What is that? That is the ah, so, that is the uh, menu bar. A bunch of ma mouse events happening in the background. Uh huh. So if I can actually bring Gorm to the front, yeah. There we go. And can I hide that menu? Ah, that is the menu for the application. That's the menu for the application. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it just it looks different because it uh, Gorm doesn't. So I'm going to move that down now horizontally. Right. Okay, so we currently don't have a window, which is why um, there was no window uh, in view. So right. what we're going to do is to drag a window out onto the screen. And now we do have a window. There we go. Oh, God, this is annoying. Um, right, so if I hit visible at launch time and change the title, maybe, that's the wrong keyboard. That, that was my fault, that one. <laughs> okay, and then uh, save. And because this is a uh, next or a Mac style environment. I've got a command key, so it's command S to save, not control S or alt F4 or whatever you're meant to do on. This is one of the things that keeps me, uh, I realize it sounds trivial. This is one of the things that keeps me as a Mac user, the command key, because it, it means that control is available for Unix applications that need control, especially Emacs hmm. and GUI applications use the command key and that bit of consistency is very important to me from a usability perspective so now i build and run and we get a currency converter window so you know like <laughs> no no great shakes and if you're used to like using uh xcode or you know zip files or storyboards on the mac then uh, you know i haven't done anything that you're surprised by but you know if you're used to like Electron and having to install 950 npms and then uh, you know write a JSX file before you can even get a window on the screen. Um, I have done a lot less work than that. Right, and I think your the thing you're running this on has a lot less uh, RAM uh, than an Electron app that does nothing takes. Probably. Okay, so what's what's next on Great. our to do list? So uh, it suggests uh, in in the in the book, mm. it the next thing it talks it shows the putting the controls in the window. I think that's probably the okay yeah the next thing to do. That they <laughs> so they do the thing I was talking about um, in the pre-stream. Uh, uh, in my copy, we may be looking at different editions, uh, but my copy says set the width of the window to uh and the height of the window and okay. oh right yeah before the stream we were talking about auto layout um and i i recalled uh a, a, a thing that i came up with at the when i was working at at uh, uh one of the banks in sweden i was working on the ios app and i ended up writing some code that uh, there was no documentation. There was no um, n no information on this. But somebody on the team knew that the crashing bug I had created was because I put these two lines of code after those two lines of code. Right. Not documented anywhere. Uh, and it was auto layout related. And it pissed me off. So uh, uh, ACOSM is asking in chat uh, that Gorm Project Builder can be installed in any li Linux distribution distribution that is correct yes the easiest thing to do um if you're on a linux uh is to use a script called gnu step startup sh which i think is in the gnu step organization on mm -hmm. github 
uh, that will just get all of the dependencies, fetch um, GNU step from Git, and then build and run the latest one. Uh, you know, there are packages. Right. Um, the packages, particularly in Debian, tend to be like quite a long way behind just because they don't um, make stable releases that often. Yeah, uh, Debian is, uh, even with the latest release of Debian, it's your grandmother's software. Hmm. Um, which is a feature, not a bug. So I would like to be able to actually see this window, which I no longer can. Um, let me... Is, there, is it in the Windows list? There it is. Yeah. There we go. So it, it is smaller... Make sure it's saved. Um, and it, although we are allowed to resize it because we're in GORM, it is not resizable in the app. So what I can do now, um, I don't think Xcode allows you to do this anymore, is I can um, test the interface. So this is now uh, effectively hosted by GORM, but it's running, like it's running my UI code. It doesn't have any of my uh, custom Objective C code because it's just running the the UI objects I've defined. But I can see that I'm, you know, I don't get the resize pointer. I'm not allowed to resize this uh, window anymore. So then I click the test, and I'm back to the editor. That's badass. Yeah, and that was something that. Uh, next interface builder I need you to do. Uh, what it lets you do is kind of test all of the resizing and the tab between uh, responders and like you know the key inputs and things, but it doesn't let you run any of your code. So it's like you know it's a very sort of like basic preview mechanism. Right, this is telling me I want a text field now. Yes. Uh, which will be in the controls menu. That looks like it. See, that has come to the front, which is annoying. Um, that looks like a text field. I'll drop it in. And I even get the resize guidelines. Beautiful. So, oh, th this is due, I think, to um, TeamViewer. I think it's just generating extra. UI events that we're not actually making. Um, I don't <laughs> know what to do that. All right. <laughs> anyway, we can, uh, in theory, grab that thing, copy it, and uh, create another one. There we go. And we can create uh, another one. Ah, I'm still using the wrong blooming window, uh, wrong keyboard. I keep going, why, why doesn't anything work? And the answer is because I'm typing into the wrong keyboard. Um, How many keyboards do you have there? Uh, two. One for the computer that's running the stream and one for the computer that's running the, um, the Aha. virtual machine. So if I um, put this down here... This one is my development computer. This is what I, you know, what I need to type the Objective C's on, and this one is the one I need to um, accidentally delete things in the uh, broadcast software. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, um, a Cosmic Gorman project builder can be installed on any distro, on uh, any BSD operating system, on any Unix on Windows and and on Mac. You can you know, just build them, run them out anywhere. <laughs> it's just kebab says you need a keyboard Rolodex. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. I've got another computer on here that doesn't actually work with either of those keyboards, so there's a, a third keyboard tucked under a shelf for when I need to use that one. Um, <laughs> that, is, that is much more difficult on the Amiga stream uh, when yeah. we... Uh, yeah. Um, because each computer has a different keyboard and there are multiple computers sometimes. Mm. So what it wants me to do now ooh, is to make this one not editable because right. this, this is going to be where the output of the application is shown. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then it tells me to create three labels and to uh, al align them and to put some um, some helpful text. Yeah. All right. So, and weirdly, you don't do the text by editing it there. You do the text. Uh, well, it should be in there. Uh, oh. Ah, no, you do do it by double-clicking oh, that. That's okay. my mistake. That evidently doesn't fit, but we can resize it, and it and it will now only let me shrink it to the minimal size. That's uh, helpful. Yeah. See now my copy and paste works. Now that I'm using the correct keyboard. That's also helpful. Yeah. Using the correct keyboard helps. Turns out you don't need a keyboard Rolodex after all. No, I just need half a brain. <laughs> and this one says amount of the currency. So I'm not sure if I'm having mostly network problems here, uh, or if O'Reilly is having network problems, or if their software is just garbage. But I'm uh, having definitely a, really a little hard bit of time reading three. this. Okay. Because uh, this is, yeah, this is not acceptable, and I'm going to just buy a physical copy of the book, which I had, I had intended to do. Mm. I just wasn't sure which house I was going to be in at the time it would arrive. Um, I expect that this book was probably um, you know, written in some internal uh, Apple XML tool in, uh, like, you know, 1998, and then converted using some XSLT into... Uh, doc book for um, right. for O'Reilly to publish and has then been converted into whatever JSON shit they now use for sending to the website. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, I'm on page turns and so on. I'm just uh, it sometimes is just failing to to carry on. But anyways, that's a, that's a problem I can solve in the future. Mm. Um, what a pain in the ass though. <laughs> I was uh, I was expecting oh no problem I can I can grab online whatever book we need. So this now wants me to do a horizontal line, which is really hard to pick up and drag. Turns out that that yeah I can I can see that uh, that being difficult. I'm happy to not bother with it. Uh, yeah, the horizontal line doesn't have any. Uh, But that that might be a thing to um, to make a note of. Wrong wrong keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean that, that would be the kind of bug. It'd be interesting to see how to yeah whether we can fix because I I have looked into the drag and drop implementation in Gorm before, so I probably remember enough about the code to at least find out where it is and then. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see, let's see whether we could do something about it. So maybe that's a task for a future stream. Another thing is to use, um, you know, sh uh, look at other things like GS Markup or Renaissance uh, instead of um, the instead of Gorm, which is an XML based. Yeah, uh, and the GS Markup files are there, so um, uh, we could we can take a look at those. I can see them in Project Builder. Hmm. So there is um, a navigation via tab. Uh, what I could do to set that is in the connections, this next key view connection. So I think I control drag. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Control drag to there. And then that is the next key view. And then on this one, 
control dragged that one. This is the bit of of uh, Coco development that I think is just the best. It's 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 awesome. Is that because we we don't have to write any stupid square brackets in Objective C? <laughs> the square brackets never bothered me. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's like the uh, <laughs> right. A lot of people complain about them. No, I know. But mm. um, it's like the parentheses in Lisp. They just when you once you understand the language, they melt away. You don't really. Yeah. They don't get in the way. Yep. So now I'm going to run this in the simulator again, and I can um, not not do anything. Right? Oh, well, I didn't have uh, focus, so uh, I can press Control A to go to the beginning, Control uh, E to go to the end, because we all get Emacs shortcuts in our GNU step controls. Uh, but I can type in there. I can type in there. I can't type in there because that one's not editable. But I do get to tab around and I can click the button. So the UI works. Great. Yes. Uh, and presumably, if I made the um, button the, uh, the default responder... resize it a bit Oops. then I could also um, press return to, uh, to to do its action but we haven't written its action yet mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff about resizing the um, controls in the window so the window looks better but we're doing a lot of uh, messing about with um, the ah there's a good point uh, in chat, Eugene nineteen suggests since the la the third text field is not editable, yep. we should just jump to the convert button. We can do that, and that's an easy change to make in Coco. It is if your mouse events are playing ball. Right? Do you have, how many mice do you have? Uh, oh. I just crashed Gorm. Hmm. Well, oh, that was impressive. Yeah. And and now I <laughs> there all right. Hey, there we go. Oof, that's good. We were getting uh, it was saving as we go, I guess. Or it didn't actually crash; it just hid. Or that. I've got a feeling that the the mouse is uh, the the team view is just generating spurious events, and so it probably was one of them as a hide. Aha. Uh -huh. So yeah, as the Cosmos says, you do want to be able to select that result and copy it into another app. Um, but the it is going to be more standard to want to in, input and then convert, and so we'll yep. allow people to. You know, you can you can still click in there and select, um, but yep. you you can't. Uh, get there by tab at the moment. We could make that control the next key view of the button, um, but then it would be weird because you go one, two, four, three. Uh, mm -hmm. So, having made that change, I'm just getting bored of, uh, of like repeatedly connecting that that outlet lots and lots of times. I'd like to move on with the rest <laughs> of the app. That's literally all of my uh, motivation for not engaging with that question anymore. We could we could add uh, as as a future exercise a button that copies the text to the clipboard. Yep. So the the other thing it wants us to do though is uh, to select the window and drag to this text field and make that the initial first responder, so that when you launch, right. the um, the keyboard focuses on that text view. Right. So this is now we're on to the defining the code part. Um, so for those who like typing their Objective C's, uh, yeah, we've got a, a bit of that ahead of us, and we're going to do it the way that it was done in Next Step and the way it was done in early Mac OS Ten, and not the way that you would do it in like, Xcode these days. And again, this isn't 
necessary for doing Gnu Step. This is necessary for following this tutorial in the order that it was written. Um, but what we're going to do is create the object in GORM, define its outlets and actions in GORM, hook them up, and then uh, generate its source files and edit them in Project Center. Mm -hmm. Rather than editing a bunch of source files in Project Center and then coming in and reading them in GORM. You know, six or one half doesn't the other. So in classes, we want to uh, find NS object and we want to subclass it. We want to um, rename this class to Converter Controller. And then uh, add an outlet. A constant says so you wrote this app from Duncan's book. Uh, so yeah, the second edition is the Jaguar edition of the book. This is the um, yeah, that's the one I'm looking at actually. Right, I have got the first edition, which is the Cheetah edition, ten point zero. So we want a rate field. Yeah, I I would have also used this book on. Uh... I had a first gen power book the P, uh, PVC power book the 12 inch one that I that I did that I, I started learning really doing this stuff on those were great machines yeah I mean it, it's amazing how much our sort of expectations have moved on though like, you know, I, I would now be frustrated by a three hour battery life on a on a laptop. Oh yeah, yeah. If you want a free three-hour battery life, though, there are ways to accomplish that. Oh yeah, just like run the <laughs> Slack app. Right, right. Okay, so that was the converter controller, and then we also want a class called the converter. It's also amusing that you think you got three hours of battery life on a twelve-inch power book. The 17 inch power book could get three and a half hours. Um, but the battery was massive. Yeah, uh, I had the um, Wall Street G3, uh, which had. Oh, that was a good one. Uh, and it had two removable bays, like one for battery, one for CD ROM, but you could take the CD ROM out and put another battery in. Okay, so we've created all of the classes that it wants us to create. Um, going to save at this point. Uh, then we need to instantiate the converter. Sorry, the converter controller. Mm -hmm. So what this does is uh, this gives us an instance of the object that's defined in the GORM file. Uh, you know, rather than kind of having some like app delegate uh, object where we go right, you know, I'm going to create my controller, then I'm going to uh, you know, load its window, and then I'm going to hook everything together. Um, it's essentially, people used to use IB as a sort of cheap dependency and version framework for uh, you know for a long time. Uh, then we have to hook up all of these um, outlets and. That's going to take a while. Wrong keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> One day I will learn.
nice. And oh, oh, ow, stop clicking on things. Mr. Random Clicky. It's definitely not me. No, I, 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 like I say, I think there's just like, um, you know, weird fake events being generated by Team Viewer. Um, we have the reason I've been doing a lot of the typing is that we always have this problem on these streams that uh, yeah. whoever is uh, is the Team Viewer client, no. Oh, doesn't actually get to um, type all of the uh, controls very accurately. And for we, we've mostly worked it out for just standard typing. Um, for the first month of Amiga streams, we were I, I was unable to type curly braces. Yeah. Um, I don't think and, you can type uh, curly braces in um, in this, can you? I, I definitely can't hear, but when we do the Amiga stream, I can. Right. Uh, but w what we ended up doing, or what I ended up doing, was just copying, uh, uh, yanking, uh, rather, killing uh, a, uh, an open-closed pair and then yanking them as I needed them. Mm. <laughs> because Control-Y worked in Emacs, but yeah, yeah, yeah. typing the braces didn't. But the curly braces then started working, and uh, but in this one... Uh, we're getting enough randomness that I'm not. Uh, I, I'm I'm basically following along, but not trying. I'm mostly just trying to not disrupt it, um, because there's enough. There, there's some fiddliness here that we just aren't prepared to. Uh, we, we aren't ready for it yet. Yeah. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll get better. This, I I guarantee you this. Uh, uh, you know, stream number one of this. Uh, um, episode number one of this stream is much more uh, streamlined than episode number one of the other stream. <laughs> yeah, now what was uh, supposed to happen at that point was that uh, Project Center was supposed to notice that Gorm had created these files and uh, add them to the project uh, automatically. And that is done by... Um, and I'm sorry I put these in the resources folder. I was not paying attention when I... Uh, I chose where to save them. Um, ah, no, I don't see the header files. Oh, yeah, I also don't see the header files. Oh, they're already there. It's picked them. So oh, it has picked those okay. up automatically. Nice. Okay. okay, there we go. All right. So, yeah, um... Like so, maybe that um, that NS notification. So that that's done with the distributed notification center. When Gorm saves, it uh, posts a notification. Or when it, Gorm creates class files, it says I created class files for this document. And then Project Center is supposed to receive that notification and go. Well, I I've got that document open in my project. Um, I will add those files myself. That didn't work in that case, so that is potentially another bug in um, in one of Gormor Project Center that we could mm -hmm. look at in a future stream. Uh, so we are, so I've generated the sources. Um, so it wants me to create a method on the converter. Convert amount. I'm going to editorialize here and give better um, variable names. Uh, yeah, there aren't any outlets and actions. So at that time, Gorm noticed that I had saved the file in Project Center even though Project Center didn't notice I created the file in GORM. So, 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 you know, something is working. Right. So 
So what they've done is they they've sort of followed the uh, MVC pattern. Um, of what the what they haven't done is um enough to make all of that work actually yeah in, interestingly the the app as um as written in the tutorial from here to the end of the project isn't actually going to work i will I, I will write it and then we will get the um, the, the crowd to debug it. Uh, so uh, in ConverterController.m we already have this uh, action method which has been defined uh, and so we say we define some variables We get the values from the UI. The, converse the sound it. from your mechanical the sound from your mechanical keyboard is very nice. This is a uh, Ducky Shine Six, which is my favourite of the keyboards I've got, um, because I also have uh, the, the so the one that's connected to the streaming computer is a Logitech, no not a Logitech, DAS Keyboard X50, uh, which is a nice keyboard, it's just like a, you know, a, a bit um, stiffer and a bit, uh, it just doesn't feel as fluid to write on. And on my work computer, which is over there, I have got a Matthias Tactile Pro 4, which is fairly nice, but just <laughs> way too loud. Okay, that is everything that I'm told to do. Uh, by oh no, there's one other thing. Ah, uh, include converter. Yep. Or import. Right. So, for those who are experienced at Objective C. Um, you will notice that uh, they have included, and uh, and the tutorial told me to hash, hash import, and it's you know, pretty much conventional in Objective C to hash import, um, but this generated code uses hash include. This is an old bugbear of Richard Stallman's. He he's got an article on the glue.org website about how hash import is a stupid idea, um, and so. A lot of the GNU step code will conventionally not use hash import. Hash import isn't actually that stupid of an idea. There is an edge case where it can not import a file that you have already um, that that you have not already imported. But uh, you know, if you have triggered that edge case, then you have designed your project badly. Or, or maybe it's like you, you, know, you can double import a file if you have two hard links to the same file or something like that. There, there, there is some weird thing you can do that will break hash import. And so, at some point in the past, RMS said never use hash import, and so the GNU coding standards tell you not, not to. Right. So, um, who wants to tell me why this isn't going to work? I want to. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't see it. What does this line do? Uh, it converts the amount that we got from the dollar field and sends the rate, which we got from rate field. What do these square brackets do? 
message send. Okay. To what? And so they give back... Uh, oh, we have an instantiated converter. Nope. Exactly. Right. Uh, Eugene 19 nope. got there slightly before you did, but... Right. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't tell me, you know, w there are many things we could have done there. We could create the object. Uh, we could create um, create an instance. We could create the object locally in the method, which is what we'll do because life's right. too short. We could create an instance variable in code. Or what we could have done is instantiated it in um, uh, in GORM and then right. added another outlet to the... Um, you know, to the converter controller, and then hooked up that outlet in GORM so that it knew where the converter was. Uh, right. the, the tutorial didn't do any of those three things. Maybe that's fixed in the second edition. Um, uh, the page is still loading, so I can't tell you. So I am going to <laughs> do that. I'm going to get annoyed by the mouse. I'm going to build again. Oop, that it seems to be complaining. Yeah, um, and not really letting me mouse particularly well. Ah, uh, yeah, because I didn't uh, type very good objectives oh. there. Right. Uh, no arc by default, um, UG19, but it is available. You just have to add the minus F of C arc um, compiler flag. Uh, and actually, that is true of, of Apple's Clang compiler as well. It's just that Xcode projects turn that flag on for you by default. So... Yeah, we could tidy up. We could make that not have that placeholder. But let's say that there's 1.2 thingies to the dollar. That I've got $100 and I get 120 thingies. Um, so uh, that's a very that's a very quick currency converter. <laughs> it would have been a lot quicker had uh, had the mouse worked correctly. Had I remembered which keyboard to type on. Um, you know, ha had we not stopped to talk about all of the things we like about Objective C and Interface Builder along the way, um, right? But yes, that is the fifteen-minute blog of uh, you know of the Coco world. That's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I I'm pleased that uh, on on stream the first we arrived at a working solution. <laughs> Yes, because I think I, I've got a feeling that on the Amiga stream it took uh, uh, Q Coding, who is um, an expert at TDD in Objective C and Swift, is uh, happy to see that. Uh, we are happy to see you, Q Coding. Uh, nice to see you here. Yes, on the Amiga stream it took us two streams to get to our first working Hello World executable, uh, if I remember rightly. Uh, that sounds accurate. Um... <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, and on the Amiga stream, we've now sort of hit a stride and, a, and a, uh, you know, we the streams are pretty good. But it it was, uh, there there was a month of, uh, of, of uh, every stream was a bit painful. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. And that was, uh, so this is, uh, this is good. We do have some issues to sort out. I would like to see, I think, a higher resolution from the, uh, uh, more screen space mm. from the uh, computer. Um, I definitely want to, uh, in the future when we do more coding to figure out the keyboard issues and so on. Yeah. But, what I'm going to um, try, I'm, I'm pleased with that. What I'm going to try between now and next week is, uh, switching to, uh, either Debian or Ubuntu, um, for the virtual machine, because that will give, um, a ability to use the virtual box host tools, which will probably do a better job of. Um, right. Both the display scaling and the, um, the like keyboard and mouse events. Um, right. Eugene nineteen points out that the UI is really choppy. So, uh, for inside baseball reasons, we probably can't do without a V. Oh, wait a minute. We might be able to do without a VM. You're already on two different computers, right, Graham? Yeah, absolutely. So I could um, so use a Raspberry Pi or a well, we uh, could just run Pi TeamViewer on the Ubuntu machine. Yeah, but that I mean um, that mean that means I need to have an Ubuntu machine. 
Oh, you mean on the Ubuntu VM? No, that would be a bad idea. Uh, or no, I mean uh, actually, like in you could put. Uh, uh, is the VM for the the live step VM is on uh, your Nook, right? Yeah, that's right. Right. So if you just uh, set up a USB key with U Ubuntu, ah, yeah, you could boot be for from that. that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And put uh, TeamViewer on it, then or, uh, I think we would be in good shape. I've got a, a drawer full of um, Pine sixty fours down there, so I could. <laughs> I could use on them. That would be that would be awesome. Hmm. Um, if we uh, yeah that that would be awesome. So yeah, so there there are some imp there are some improvements available, but I'm uh, very happy that we got through uh, some of the history in a non chronological fashion. Uh, we got through our uh, our likes, our dislikes, our loves, our hates, and uh, our missed opportunities and missed connections, and we got working software. Absolutely, um, and we and that got... is the primary measure of progress. Well, uh, and we got an audience who enjoyed what we were doing, which is also uh, uh, of benefit to uh, streaming. Definitely, there are still a, a a bunch of people hanging out. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, thank you, everyone. It's uh, great to have your uh, help and your input and your questions. Um, if you if you have any ideas about what you want to see on future streams, uh, you can email our names at obshi-retain.com uh, we will also I, I will definitely post this stream to YouTube and I will try to sort out some kind of free software video hosting uh, to put it on as well um, it's a shame that that peer tube instance so use has gone away but there are others or we could create our own um, there will definitely be our own and uh yeah we will try to sort out some of the issues for next week and we will definitely be back next week uh same time 1900 utc uh on wednesday the 17th of february great that's awesome thanks Excellent. for joining thank us everyone yeah thank we'll you, see you next week. again everyone we will see you later take care